Good evening. I am Carl Thomas, the chairman of the board of directors of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Gertrude Pope Brown Lecture Series, featuring author H.W. Brands and his latest book, The Zealot and the Emancipator, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and the Struggle for American Freedom. This lecture series was initiated in 1993 as a memorial to the life of Gertrude Pope Brown and made possible by the continuous generous support of her family, Dace Brown Stubbs, G. Garvin Brown IV, Laura Lee Brown, Garvin Dieters, Laura Lee Gastus, and Pope Dieters. This series brought internationally recognized historians to Louisville. More than 36,000 citizens have learned more about the significant stories of our region nation and world because of the Gertrude Pope Brown lectures. The Filson is grateful for this generosity. Tonight, I'm honored to reintroduce H.W. Brands as our Gertrude Pope Brown speaker. This is his third visit with us and we're so thrilled to have him back. Dr. Brands taught at Texas A&M University for 16 years before joining the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin where he holds the Jack S. Blanton Senior Chair in History. His books include Traitor to His Class, Andrew Jackson, The Age of Gold, and The First American. Traitor to His Class and The First American were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Now, it's indeed my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. H.W. Brands. At the conclusion of the lecture, Richard Clay, President and CEO of the Felsen, will moderate questions as time permits. Thank you, Carl, for that very warm reintroduction. I'm delighted to be back at the Filson Historical Society, if only virtually. And I'm delighted to have another chance to talk to one of the most historically aware audiences uh, uh, in the country. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. I'm gonna talk this evening about how it is that I wrote a book about John Brown and Abraham Lincoln. I'll talk about the book to some degree, but this is gonna be a little bit more of the background of what went into it and why I chose to write the, the subject that I did. I have been teaching American history for 35, well, 30, more than 35 years now. And during all this time, I try to find ways to make history come alive to my students. It's very easy for history to seem far removed from what students do. I have, I, I cannot see the audience for this event this evening, but if it's anything like the audiences that I've spoken before at the Filson in my previous visits, I'm gonna guess that the average age of this audience is somewhat older than the average age of my students. I make a point of teaching an introductory course in American history. And my students are mostly freshmen and sophomores, which means that they are 18 and 19 years old. And I can say from long experience that history comes a little bit harder or at least less naturally to 18 year olds than it does to people, let's say 68 or older. I think that the more history one has in his or her own life, the easier it is to appreciate the history of other people. So I have to, I have to challenge myself to get the students interested. And in connection with this, I have concluded over the years that the big questions of history are timeless questions that humans simply have to deal with. These are, these are questions of human nature and in the case of my topic this evening, of human responsibility. And I'll focus on the responsibility of a citizen in a republic or more precisely a citizen in a democracy where the citizens have some responsibility for the way the country operates the way the country runs. When I speak to my students, I often say that if you, dear students, at the age of 18, do not like the world that you are becoming an adult in, blame me, blame people of my age, blame the people who have had uh, much of a lifetime 
of responsibility for creating this world. So if you don't like the world in 2020, I tell my students, okay, you can blame me, it's our fault. But the odds are very good. Statistically, the odds are overwhelmingly in favor of the fact that you, my students, will still be alive 50 years from now when you're my age. And if you don't like the world then, then you've got to blame yourself because you've had a chance to create the world. The courses that I teach, uh, th this particular introductory course, is essentially a required course in American history. And this because the legislature of the state of Texas, with which I do not always agree, has chosen to make two semesters of American history a requirement for all students in public universities in Texas. I think this is a very good thing because these students are going out to become citizens of the United States and they need to know something about the United States and how we got to where we are today. Anyway, so I pose questions to my students. I, I very often say, imagine that you were George Washington. Imagine that you were Abigail Adams. And I'll set up a moment for, okay, so this is a decision that William McKinley has to make at the end of the Spanish-American War. What would you do? So I pose questions to them. And sometimes the questions are simply matters of politics. So you're Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Do you keep Hannibal Hamlin as your vice presidential candidate when running for re-election? And Lincoln decides not on political grounds. So sometimes the questions are political. Sometimes they have to do with foreign policy. If you were Lyndon Johnson in 1965, would you have escalated the American role in the war in Vietnam? But very often the questions come down to a fundamental kind of moral issue, an ethical issue. And the question that motivates my book on John Brown and Abraham Lincoln is the basic question that any citizen has to deal with at some time or other. But I would also say that pretty much people have to deal with it sometime or other. And the question is this, what does the good person do in the face of evil? What do you do when you see something bad happening? Do you confront it? Do you turn around? Do you walk away? What do you do? And this comes up in American history sort of all the time. If I ask my students, if you were alive in 1776, would you have chosen to become a rebel, to break away from the British government? Or would you have been a loyalist? Would you have decided that your responsibility to the British Empire was important and something that needed observing? So this is a question that generations have to make. I, I tell my students, I'm a bit too young to have been around during the civil rights protests of the early 1960s that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I was born in 1953, so I would have been you know, 11 or 12. So I, I wasn't aware or involved in those, but I was in college during the early 1970s when the divisive issue of American politics was the war in Vietnam. And by then, a lot of people, including me, thought that the Vietnam War was really a bad deal. It was bad policy at, at the least. It might have been you know, downright immoral by that point because should you keep fighting a war that you know you're going to lose? Anyway, so I did actually engage in protests, but I didn't go so far as some people that I knew. And there were people who thought that the war in Vietnam was so wrong that it allowed, maybe it even required more than simply marching, listening to speeches, perhaps taking direct action. I knew people who threw bricks through the windows of buildings where de uh, Defense Department research was being done. I was on college campus at this point. And they said, you know, okay, so, so I did $3,000 worth of damage. Well, the, the damage that's being done in Vietnam is far greater than that. And if this helps stop the war, then it's justified. So this is, this is the, these are the kind of questions that generations are called upon to ask in the last several months, since last spring. People around the country have been asking themselves, what do we do in response to egregious manifestations of, and depending on your interpretation, police brutality, racial discrimination, economic inequality, all of this stuff. And a lot of people have been in the streets. And do, or is one required to go in the streets? Is this an ethical responsibility? Of course, it depends on sort of where you think right and wrong lie in this. But to me, the interesting question, and the one I pose in my book, it starts 
with the assumption that the people that I'm looking at, in particular John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, agree that the institution of slavery is wrong. But then the question is, that's, that's the easy part of the question. The, the easy part of the question is concluding that it's wrong. Now I have to add though, not everybody during the lifetime of John Brown and Abraham Lincoln thought that slavery was wrong. This being a democracy, if everybody thought it was wrong, it wouldn't have existed. It would have you know, been voted out of existence. So some people thought it was, well, I'm gonna actually get to what people thought about slavery. But anyway, so the question that I pose to my students, the question that I pose to readers in my book, in fact, it's, uh, this is not a spoiler exactly, but the opening line of chapter one is, what does the good man do when his country is involved in a great evil? And so this is the question I pose. And then I look at it through the life and actions of John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, because they agreed that slavery was wrong. They agreed that slavery was bad policy. They agreed that slavery was morally wrong. But as I said, that's the easy part. The hard part is, so what are you gonna do about it, John Brown? What are you gonna do about it, Abraham Lincoln? And this is what I investigate. Because it is a question that's the heart of well, this fundamental question of what do you do in the face of evil? And in particular, what does the citizen do when that citizen thinks that the government is engaged in a wrong course? And it could be a wrong course that simply uh, housing subsidies should be great or something like that, or you know, something more fundamental than that. This war is uh, a crime or something like that. So anyway, this is the question I pose. Now, I when I pose the question to my students, this is one where I actually, I don't ask them, what would you have done about John Brown? Or what would you have done if you were Abraham Lincoln? But I do ask them a question, what would you have done if you were Frederick Douglass? So my two protagonists are John Brown and Abraham Lincoln. But my third character, I call him sort of my second and a half protagonist, is Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass comes into my story because he knew both men. I have to tip my author's hand and say, John Brown and Abraham Lincoln never met. In fact, Abraham Lincoln was not aware of John Brown's existence until just the last couple of years of John Brown's life. And John Brown probably wasn't aware of Abraham Lincoln's existence, perhaps maybe even until the end of his life. He, John Brown was not a political junkie. And so he wasn't paying attention to what was going on in the politics of Illinois in the 1850s. But their, what shall I say, their historical trajectories intersected. And Frederick Douglass is the person between. So here's the question that I put to my students. You are Frederick Douglass. I give them a little background of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass had been born a slave. He escaped to freedom. He was uh, a slave in Maryland. He escaped to freedom in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. And he went on to become one of the most influential and widely noted abolitionists in America during the 1850s and until emancipation in 1865. And he also knew John Brown. And so John Brown, just a few days before he launches his raid on Harper's Ferry, the action that would make him famous or infamous, depending on your position, is about to happen. And John Brown asks Frederick Douglass to come along, to join in the raid. And he says, Fred, which is what Frederick Douglass's friends called him, Fred, um, I could, we really need you on this, this raid. And so I have to explain to my students a little bit, so what's involved here? What's this raid gonna entail? And I explain that John Brown is an abolitionist. Now, my students have been reading about this, so they know what an abolitionist is, but I'll, I'll put a reminder here that there were gradations of opposition to slavery. As I say, then there were people who were in favor of slavery. Uh, much of the South was in favor of slavery, but there was a lot of opposition to slavery. But the opponents of slavery, they ran from everybody who thinks that's ah, just kind of a bad idea to some of the some people who thought that it was the most immoral thing in American life. And the ones who were on the, the end of it's the most immoral thing in American life and something has to be done about it at once, these were the abolitionists. They believed in the immediate and thorough emancipation of all slaves. And no other question rises to the level of slavery. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about this. Slavery has to end. 
Those were the abolitionists. John Brown was one of those. More on this in a moment. Abraham Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln was opposed to slavery, but he was what I'll call a constitutional emancipationist. He believed that emancipation would be good for the United States. He believed that it would be good for slaves. That almost goes without saying, but it would also be good for the slave holders, whites in the South. It would be good for the country as a whole, but it had to be done under the auspices of the constitution. It had to be done under the rule of law. Anything that violated the constitution that broke the law would be counterproductive to the end of abolishing slavery. So Lincoln is a gradual, a constitutional emancipationist. And then there were other people who thought that slavery is just kind of a bad thing, but you know they didn't care that much one way or the other about it. So I put the question to my students. You are Frederick Douglass. John Brown has asked you to go along in this raid. I haven't told them what the raid is. He is going to lead, he's going to lead an attack of about two dozen people on a federal arsenal, a place where weapons are stored at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. It's now in West Virginia, but it was Virginia in those days. You're going to lead this raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry for the purpose of seizing the weapons at Harper's Ferry and distributing them among slaves in the vicinity to the end that those slaves will rise up against their masters. They will use these weapons to rise up against their masters and claim their freedom. So what Frederick, excuse me, what John Brown had in mind was an insurrection, an armed insurrection by slaves. And he says to Frederick Douglass, come along you will lend enormous credibility to this enterprise because you have been a slave. And the people that I'm appealing to, they will have much more confidence in your judgment and your urging that they join than if it just comes from me. I've never been a slave. Frederick Douglass thought about this. Well, oh, actually, so I posed the question to my students, said, what would you do? And some of them asked questions. Okay, so what are the chances of success? Who are they, who's the opposition? And I, I asked the questions um, and I, you know, I could give you all a moment to think about this. What would you do? What would you have done had you been there? Well, I'll tell you what Frederick Douglass decided. He said, no, I'm not going with you. He believed that John Brown was on the right track. He believed he supported John Brown's opposition to slavery. Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist. He believed that slavery was so wrong that it should be done away with immediately. But he wasn't going to join John Brown in an armed attack on a federal arsenal for the purpose of starting a slave insurrection. And part of this was Frederick Douglass taking the position, and he talks about this in his autobiography, that he'd already fought for his own freedom and he wasn't gonna go there again. He doesn't, you know. The other thing was that Frederick Douglass did, took the position, you know, I'm a writer, not a fighter, and other people are better at this. You, John Brown, are better at this kind of thing than I am. But the real reason was that Frederick Douglass concluded that John Brown's raid was in all likelihood going to be a suicide mission, that John Brown would not achieve his goal of distributing weapons among the slaves in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, nor would there be a slave insurrection. The only thing that would happen is that John Brown and his followers would be killed. They would be killed either in the fighting that surrounded this raid, or they'd be arrested and tried and executed. Now, in fact, again, I don't want to give too much away, but that's what happened. Okay, so I want to give a little bit of background. So how we get to Harper's Ferry, I'm going to tell you a little bit about John Brown. Actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Abraham Lincoln too, because these are the, the two poles of my narrative and my analysis. John Brown was born in 1800. He was born in Connecticut. He was a New Englander by birth, but his family moved to Ohio when he was quite young. So he grew up uh, an Ohioan and he played and did stuff that Ohio boys did. Now, he lived in a part of Ohio that wasn't very far from Kentucky. And there was a fundamental difference between Ohio and Kentucky in those days that Kentucky allowed slavery and Ohio did not. The Ohio River was the boundary between the slave South and the free North, or in this, these, those days, the free Northwest. Nonetheless, in Ohio, 
John Brown, young John Brown, this kid, uh, got to, became aware of slavery, or at least he, he had slaves pointed out to him because sometimes uh, people make the natural mistake of thinking that there were slaves in the South, but there weren't any slaves in the North. Well, by, well, actually in 1800, there were still slaves in pretty much every state. Um, Northern states had started to emancipate, but very often it was a phased in emancipation. In New York, for example, slaves, there were still slaves in New York in the 1830s. Um, and these were kind of grandfathered in. If you were, the, the way it worked is that slaves born after a particular date would become free upon reaching their 21st birthday. If you're already older than that, then you'd be a slave for the rest of your life. Anyhow, so John Brown was aware of slavery. He could see people working in the fields. Some were white and some of them were black. And it, some, at times it was pointed out to him, oh, those black workers, those are slaves. But John Brown never really understood what that meant until, until one day when he was playing with this, this other kid, a black kid who happened to be a slave, but that didn't register with John Brown until they'd been playing for a while. And then all of a sudden, this man, this white man, came up to the black boy and started yelling at him and then started hitting him over the head and shoulders. And John Brown was amazed at this. Um, you know, this, nobody except maybe John Brown's father could get away with doing this. And it was fairly clear this guy wasn't the, the black kid's father. Um, but he was, you know, his, his owner, his master. And John Brown later said that at that moment, he realized that there was something fundamentally wrong about slavery, that, that my life is very different from this other boy's life because he's a slave and I'm not. So it got into his head that there's something really wrong about slavery. But it didn't get any farther than that for, well, another 30 years. In fact, John Brown was in his late 30s. He was 37 when he had what really amounted to a conversion experience regarding slavery. Now, John Brown might not have had this conversion experience, or at least it wouldn't have had the effect that it had on him if, if he had I'll put it this way, if he had been more successful at life, John Brown, like I would say a lot of people, one way or another, find their path in life by the process of elimination. John Brown tried his hand at farming, wasn't good at that. He tried his hand at, he herded cattle, and sheep, and buying and selling them, he couldn't make any money at that. He tried business, he wasn't good at that. And so he was looking for something that he could be good at. He, look, he was looking for something that he could build his life around. He was looking for a mission in life. And it came to him. It came to him in 1837. He was living with his family in Hudson, Ohio. And news came that an abolitionist editor, Elijah Lovejoy, had been murdered by a pro-slavery mob in Illinois. And this really raised the stakes of the slavery question for John Brown and for a lot of people in the country, for abolitionists generally. Hold that thought for a moment because I have to give a little bit of background on the evolution of abolitionism. And this has a lot to do with how slavery evolved and how it got to the point by the 1850s where John Brown decided to do what he did. In 1776, a brief reminder, in 1776, Slavery was legal, authorized in all of the 13 states. And it's worth saying that pretty much everybody in the country looked on slavery the same way. Uh, everybody with the exception of slaves. So whether you own slaves or not, there was a tendency to look on slavery, first of all, as just this aspect of life. Slavery had been around forever. And most people didn't think of it much one way or the other. If you happen to be a slave, it was unfortunate. But you know, if you, if you catch yellow fever and die young, that's unfortunate too. There are a lot of misfortunes in life that you just don't, don't have any control over. But once 
the, oh, and I should say, so the feeling was that slavery was this fact of life. It was, it was not a good thing. It was what amounted to a necessary evil. It was one of those things in life that, okay, we're not thrilled with it, but we can't figure out how to do without it. Here, I'll digress a moment to say that this is another exercise I do with my students. Actually, I do this. I can't remember if I did it with the Filson when I was uh, here before, but I pose a question to my audience, my audience. And I've asked them, first of all, if they think that war is a good thing. So how many warmongers are there out in the crowd? So those of you who are watching, if you're a warmonger, please raise your hand. Or maybe you can uh, put the reaction, you know, put a plus on there, a thumbs up. Uh, I'm not seeing any, and this is kind of the reaction I get. I don't expect people to say, other things being equal, I'd like to see more war. No, almost nobody looks at that. No, it looks at things that way. I'll just add that uh, in American history, uh, this is all pose a question for you. This is a trivia question. In American history, there has been one president out of the 45 that we've had who was a warmonger, who really did think that war was a good thing. Nobody know who it is? It was Theodore Roosevelt, but it's kind of a trick question because it was Theodore Roosevelt before he became president, before he went to war. Theodore Roosevelt wanted to go to war. And once he went to war, then he said, one is enough. Anyway, so most people today in my audience, I bet, think that war is not a good thing. War is an evil. Then my next question is, how many of you are pacifists? How many of you believe that the use of force is never justified in response to evil, it's in response to attack, in response to anything? And usually out of an audience of, let's say, 400, maybe one or two people will raise their hand. And so then I think it's fair to say, and I say in conclusion, okay, I think then you all have basically admitted that you think that war is a necessary evil. That's the way people looked on slavery in the 1770s and 80s. But over the course of the next 40 years, the Northern states eliminated slavery. Why did they eliminate slavery? Did they all of a sudden think that slavery had become that much more evil than before? Did they get a fit of morality and say, oh my gosh, you know, we got to get rid of slavery because it's so terrible? No. In fact, what happened was that the Northern economy began to develop in ways that made slavery unprofitable, unnecessary. So the necessary evil was no longer necessary. So people could focus on the evil part of it. And then if you can do that, then all right, let's get rid of it. So it was a relatively easy thing for the North to give up slavery. And many Southerners from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson to Kentucky's Henry Clay were in that necessary evil category. And all three of those men were opposed to slavery, but they just couldn't quite figure out how to undo it from the Southern economy. They couldn't figure out how to run the Southern economy without slavery. They, they, they hoped that the Southern economy would evolve in ways much like the Northern economy, slavery would become superfluous, unprofitable, unnecessary. But in fact, the, slave, the, southern, the Southern economy evolved differently. Cotton became a big deal and slavery became a big part of the cotton culture. Anyway, so that's the situation as well by the 1830s. In the 1830s, for the first time, abolitionism as a potent political force takes hold in the North when it's clear that the South is not going to be giving up slavery anytime soon. William Lloyd Garrison, Boston, launches his abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. John Brown reads this. So John Brown begins to move in abolitionist circles, but the thing really catches on in 1837 when he learns that this abolitionist editor, Elijah Lovejoy, has been murdered because this seemed to John Brown and to many of the abolitionists, oh my gosh, the slave power, this was the term that they used to, to talk about the, the political South. The slave power is getting out of control where somebody can be killed simply for his opinions. You know, nobody attacks slavery, he just said it's a, it's a bad thing. And he gets killed for this. So John Brown stood up in his church in Hudson, Ohio, and he said, in the sight of God before this congregation, I hereby devote the rest of my life to the fight against slavery. My aim is the destruction of slavery. John Brown announces to the world that he is an abolitionist, but he still doesn't know exactly what form that abolition, what form that opposition is going to take. And it takes him another well, almost 20 years to sort of get his footing and get, get into his head what it is that he's going to do. 
The crucial moment comes in 1854 when Congress passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opens Kansas territory potentially to slavery. This was a slap in the face at the anti-slavery movement in America because Kansas territory, Nebraska territory, the entire northern part of the Louisiana Purchase had been declared off limits to slavery forever in the 1820 Missouri Compromise. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, 34 years later says, wait, no, nope, we're gonna repeal that. And now Kansas can be open to slavery. So this did a number of things. It caused people like John Brown to think, oh my gosh, the slave power is getting out of control. It caused people like Abraham Lincoln, a former Whig, uh, Henry Clay was his hero in politics, but by the time uh, Clay died in 1852, the Whig party was disintegrating, it was basically splitting between North and South and there wasn't anything left of it. And a new political party began to take its place. This was the Republican party. And Abraham Lincoln had saw a chance to get back into politics. He had been in politics before, but he got out of politics just to just go into practice of law and to support his family. But with the Kansas-Nebraska Act sort of reopening the slavery debate, and the debate was not at this point, not really so much about slavery in the Southern states, but about slavery in the Western, the federal territories. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act created a competition, turned out to be a violent competition for the future of Kansas. Because the deal was that Northerners can go and settle in Kansas and they can take their property, their horses, their cows, their pigs, and Southerners can go to Kansas territory and take their property, their horses, their cows, their pigs, their slaves. And they can all mingle there. And when Kansas territory has a sufficient number of inhabitants to qualify for statehood, then all these people will get together and they will write a constitution for Kansas. And the constitution will say either yes for slavery or no, no slavery. Well, you can imagine that Northern anti-slavery group said, we got to get our people to Kansas to make sure that when that constitution is written, the anti-slavery side has more votes. And Southerners said, no, no, we've got to get our people to Kansas. So when that constitution is written, it's a pro-slavery constitution because the institution of slavery by this time depended on continued expansion. This is something that's often not sort of recognized, but slavery by the 1850s had become unprofitable in on the East Coast, on much of the East Coast, including Virginia, this was the largest of the Southern states by population. Slavery was unprofitable there except, except for the export of slaves. So cotton, the cotton culture in um, Virginia wasn't a big deal. Tobacco had exhausted the soil. A lot, my, the crops were very much like Northern crops, wheat and barley and things like that. And they, those crops simply don't lend themselves to cultivation by slaves. And slavery would have been unprofitable there, except that plantation owners in Virginia could export their slaves, the children of their slaves to the West and get a good price for them. So expansion was really big deal for the, for the slaveholders and the, the slave institution. John Brown, John Brown all of a sudden finds his niche. He's been asking himself, how do I combat slavery? Now he knows, I go to Kansas. And he takes part in this contest for the future of Kansas. Kansas became a symbol of the future of slavery or freedom in America. And he goes to Kansas and he's upset that the anti-slavery group in Kansas, so-called free state settlers in Kansas, are not as stern in their defense of freedom as they ought to be. There's an attack by pro-slavery militia, well, I'll call them militia because that's basically what they were, on the free state community of Lawrence, Kansas. All this is happening in the eastern part of Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas. And uh, the, uh, the pro-slavery side, they come in and they basically destroy the town and the, the free state people are just left there you know, not doing anything. John Brown was incensed by this. And John Brown decided somebody needs to teach those pro-slavery folks a lesson, to send them a message. And so what John Brown did was he gathered a very small group of followers, five people, including two of his adult sons. And in the middle of the night, 
they descended on a pro-slavery hamlet on the banks of Pottawatomie Creek. And John Brown and this group, they dragged five settlers, men, out of their cabins in the dead of night, and they brutally murdered them. They cut them to pieces with broadswords. If this happened today, immediately be labeled terrorism. It's a textbook example of terrorism. You commit violence, in this case, lethal violence, for the purpose of sending a political message. John Brown had committed murder. In fact, now he was wanted for murder. And he had to get around the country. He fled the authorities in Kansas. The only reason he was able to get away was the fact that there weren't any photographs in those days, at least none that were easily circulatable. And so people had a written description of John Brown, but he could cut his hair and grow his beard and change his name and pretend he was somebody else. And so he circulated in the North, plotting something even bigger. And this was the raid on Harper's Ferry that I described earlier. Okay, so that's John Brown, Abraham Lincoln. John Brown has taken that question, slavery is wrong, what do I do about it? He said, basically, the slavery is so wrong that it justifies, it necessitates the use of all measures, including murderous violence in opposition to slavery. And so the murder of people who are in support of slavery, this is justified, and trying to start a war is justified, which if it actually got off the ground, would have led certainly to the deaths of hundreds of people. John Brown has taken this position. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln learns about John Brown's activities in Kansas, you know, the murderous aspect of this. He becomes, he comes face to face with John Brown. I'm not face to face, sorry, face to face with what John Brown has done when he heard, when he hears of the raid on Harper's Ferry. And Abraham Lincoln just groaned when he heard about this because he thought, oh, this makes the emancipation of slaves that much harder. Abraham Lincoln believed that John Brown was not simply morally wrong in murdering people and trying to start a war, but he was politically wrong. He was short-sighted. He didn't realize that his attack on Harper's Ferry would not free slaves. It would tighten the shackles on slaves the more, and it would make persuading slaveholders that it was in their interest to emancipate their slaves. It would push that back a decade or more. So Abraham Lincoln groaned when he heard about the raid of Harper's Ferry. And the next thing he said is that John Brown is not a Republican. By this time, Abraham Lincoln had the inside track on the Republican nomination for president in 1860. And opponents of the Republicans, they said, hey, elect Abraham Lincoln, you're gonna get John Brown because John Brown's against slavery Abraham Lincoln's against slavery. Those Republicans are all against slavery. They're all the same. And Lincoln said, no, I'm not John Brown. I'm not an abolitionist. I believe that the Constitution protects slavery in the states, that if Virginia wants to keep slaves till kingdom come, they are perfectly constitutionally able to do that. And although I think that slavery is wrong, that's their privilege under the Constitution. So Abraham Lincoln feared that John Brown had really spoiled things. Abraham Lincoln did get elected president, and all of a sudden he had to deal with this. And because the, the raid on Harper's Ferry scared the daylights out of Southerners, slaveholders especially, who felt that, my gosh, if John Brown had been able to pull off his raid, then not only would the institution of slavery be at risk, but our very lives might be at risk. He's putting rifles, he's putting weapons in the hands of slaves who are going to get their freedom by killing us all. So when Abraham Lincoln was elected, 11 Southern, seven initially, and then four more, decide to leave the union. And Abraham Lincoln has to decide, well, I do pose this question to my students. So you're Lincoln, the South has seceded. what do you do? And Abraham Lincoln decided that he would not let the South secede. But he made very clear that in resisting Southern secession, he was not fighting for the emancipation of slaves. His war was against secession. His beef was against secession. It was not against slavery. And he made very clear that this war, his war, was a war against secession. In the long-running debate, the historical debate, was the Civil War about states' rights or was it about slavery? 
I'll give you a hint, it was actually about both. But Lincoln took the position that first and foremost, it's about states' rights. More precisely, the fact that the South did not have the right to leave the Union. And he said again and again, this is why we're fighting, to save the Union. He definitely did not say we're fighting to free the slaves. When South Carolina militia fired on Fort Sumter, forcing the evacuation of, of the forest, um, Lincoln immediately then called for 75,000 volunteers. And he did not say, I want 75,000 volunteers to free the slaves. No, no. He said, I want 75,000 volunteers to save the Union. Why did Lincoln take the position, this position? First of all, because of his view of the Constitution, that the Constitution protected slavery in the states. Secondly, it was a careful, a, pragma a pragmatic balancing of interests because I said that 11 Southern states seceded, excuse me, 11 slave states seceded. Four slave states did not, including Kentucky and Missouri and Maryland and Delaware. And Lincoln understood that if he declared war against slavery, he would force Kentucky, force Missouri, force Maryland, nobody much cared about Delaware, but would force them all basically to, to join the side of the Confederacy. Simply from the standpoint of trying to hold the Union together, if he lost those states, he would lose the Union, and that would be that. So as a pragmatic matter, he could not declare war on slavery. But also he understood that most people in the North did not want to fight a war against slavery. They didn't want to risk their lives. They didn't think slavery was that big a deal. Now, eventually, Lincoln was forced to the position by Frederick Douglass, among other people, to conclude that the only way he was going to save the Union was by issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, which deprived, potentially deprived the South, the Confederacy, of much of its workforce and added those fugitive slaves, the ones who accepted his offer, to come to the Union lines, and they could augment the, the Union workforce and its military force. So Lincoln is finally driven to conclude that saving the Union requires freeing the slaves. And finally, so he, he comes around to the view that John Brown had taken that violence is going to be involved in freeing the slaves. But where John Brown took the position that he, John Brown believed that violence was the first choice, uh, Lincoln for violence the, was the, the last choice. It was the last resort to free the slaves. Now, I've talked enough. I want to see if there are questions. I want to see if there are responses and reactions. So do we have questions? Yes, you do have some questions. Doctor. Very good. Um, first, why did John Brown discontinue his abolitionist fight in the territories, that is Kansas, and then instead come back to Virginia for the raid on Harper's Ferry. What was it about Harper's Ferry that drew him? So John Brown, first of all, after the, the murders that I described, he was wanted for murder in Kansas. So he had to watch very carefully where he went. He stuck around for a while though, and led a group of, of militia uh, against the, uh, led an anti-slavery militia against the pro-slavery militias. But the situation got a little bit too hot for John Brown, but it also actually calmed down too much for his taste. So there was a new federal sheriff who was brought in who basically said to both sides, you know, anybody who engages in violence, you're going to jail or you're going to get hanged. And so John Brown, and things did calm down. And John Brown didn't want to calm down. But the other thing was, that he thought that Kansas was a sideshow in the battle against slavery because there really weren't any slaves to speak of in Kansas. John Brown decided that he had to take the battle to, and the term he used it, I need to take the battle to Africa, to the South, where there were actually lots of slaves and where a blow against slavery in the South could have telling effect. What John Brown hoped was that the uprising that would follow the raid on Harper's Ferry would so shake the institution of slavery throughout the South that Southern slaveholders would conclude, wait, my property in slaves, this is not secure. And they would basically then conclude on their own, you know, we got to get rid of slavery because they're all going to flee to freedom anyway, or we might get killed in our beds if we hang on to slavery. So John Brown, it was it was the old story of the appetite growing with the eating. He'd got a taste of direct violent action in Kansas, but he wanted to go big in that regard. And 
he imagined that he could be the leader of this army of liberation. Didn't, didn't pan out, but that's what he had in mind. This is a detailed question, but I think a very good one. This is from George Maley to everyone, but I'm going to direct it to you. Your premise and question tonight is simply, what does a good man do when faced with evil? Having read your book, which by the way is worth a read, I cannot accept that John Brown was a good man. Was Timothy McVeigh a good man? Was John Wilkes Booth a good man? Was Gavrilo Princip a good man? Uh, like Brown, they all sought change by direct action. Let me add to that question a bit. Um, because I know of a thoroughly good man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was part of a plan to kill Hitler. Is there a difference here? Are there gradations of how one takes on violence? Uh, when, at, at what point is it necessitated? Yes, so this is a very subtle question. And from the standpoint of my premise question, I wanted, to, I wanted to start with, I'll say this. I think I can say that before the Potawatomi attack in 1856 and before Harper's Ferry, John Brown to all who knew him was a good man. He was upright, he was honest, he wasn't particularly successful, he was good to his children. So, and he, and so I'll say that John Brown until then was pretty much the textbook definition of a good man. And I will say that John Brown considered himself to be a good man through the end of, of all of this. I will also say that, well, important people, well-known people thought that John Brown was not simply a good man, that he was a saint. And so when he was executed by the common, the state of Virginia for treason against Virginia and for murder in the raid on Harper's Ferry, he was declared to be a martyr to the cause of freedom. And I'll add this, that, and by the way, I'm not disputing the question. I'm just pointing out that John Brown for a whole lot of people today is actually easy to, easier to like than Abraham Lincoln. Because Abraham Lincoln, with Abraham Lincoln, you have to deal with the fact that Abraham Lincoln told jokes that had a racial element, a racist element that you know, doesn't wash today. Abraham Lincoln believed that emancipation for Southern slaves had to be accompanied by the expulsion of Southern slaves. They had to, the, the freed people, they had to go to Africa. They had to get out of the country because he couldn't figure out how the two, the two races could live side by side without one being on top. So anyway, so having said that, but the, the question is, so how far can you go? And then the Bonhoeffer question is a really good one and because that's, that's a good example. In there you have someone who is almost the, the epitome of great evil. And, and this is where you start to, to weigh, okay, maybe in some respects it's wrong to kill even Hitler. But if I don't kill Hitler, Hitler will kill millions of people. So this is, this is the, the calculus of justification. And I'll say this, that those people who thought that John Brown was right, uh, those people who did then and those people who do now, take the position that Look, the war over slavery had already begun. Slavery was violent from its very beginning. The only difference was that John Brown was one of the first to take up arms against the violence of slavery. And so John Brown, if forced to acknowledge or to account for his actions in, in Kansas, would have said, so many people have died under the slave's lash. It's finally time to help them gain their freedom. So somebody needs to fight back for them. And he would say the war had already begun. And in wars, there is collateral damage. Furthermore, when, when I talked about the people who were killed in Kansas, he deliberately, I mean, he definitely spared the women and children of the men that were killed. 
the men that came there, they had come to further the institution of slavery. So that's the way John Brown would have justified it. But this question of, in some kind of larger sense, were John Brown's actions justified? This, if you ask me, this requires answering an unanswerable question, but one that at least is worth considering. If you think that the ending of slavery in America required the Civil War, then you're willing to say, and maybe you're more likely to say, yeah, John Brown was on the right track. Because if there was this big war coming anyway, it, this sounds almost ghoulish, but you know, what's a few more casualties? Or you know, John Brown's trying to start this war. You know, Abraham Lincoln tried to avoid the war, and Lincoln led the country into the worst war in American history. 700,000 people died. So, and I'll point out that John Brown, John Brown's last words were via a note that was smuggled to his jailer as he's being led away to be hanged. And the note said that the crimes of this evil country will be purged only by blood. And so John Brown is saying, the only way we're gonna get rid of slavery is through violence. And you know, I tried to start it, didn't come. Abraham Lincoln in 1859 disagreed with this. He said, no, no, I think we can end slavery without a war. But by 1865, in his second inaugural address, Lincoln basically said that John Brown was right. He, the way Lincoln couched it was, it may be God's will that for every drop of blood drawn by the slaver's lash, another drop of blood must be drawn by the sword. I mean, that's pretty much the kind of blood atonement that John Brown had been talking about. Now, if you think that Lincoln was right there, then you're willing to say, okay, John Brown was on the right side of history and he just got there first. And okay, pat him on the back for, well, giving his life for this cause. But if on the other hand, you don't think slavery was, uh, you don't think a civil war was necessary to end slavery, then John Brown's got a lot to answer for. Well, this leads to this question, and that is, um, how would you respond to people who argue that the civil war was not about slavery? And accompanying that question is, can you elaborate on Lincoln's evolution from a, a protector of the Union to a, an actual uh, anti-slavery person and his evolution from believing that the Civil War uh, was about uh, you know, the protection of the Union to something much grander and even more noble, and that is the end of slavery. So this question of what was the Civil War about really conflates two questions. They're sequential, but they're actually distinct. One is, what's the cause of secession? And then the question is, okay, then what's the cause of the war? And it's very clear that Southern states seceded because they felt that slavery as an institution was under threat in a union that was governed now by a Republican party that was dedicated to opposition to slavery and that, that spawned people like John Brown who were willing to take arms against slavery. So that was the cause of secession. Now, it's important to note, however, that Southern states believed that secession was the right of every state, slave states or free states. South Carolina, had nearly seceded in 1833, not over slavery, but over a tariff, over a tax bill. And people in the South could point out that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, had spoken of the doctrine of nullification. This is back in the 1790s over the issue of freedom of speech. They were saying that the states can decide when the government, the central government has overstepped. Douglas, excuse me, Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster, the defender of the union, sided with the idea of secession over war powers in the War of 1812. So this question of can you secede is separate, has to be conceptually separated from, well, what will you secede over? The Southern states that seceded said, we can secede over anything. That's the right of every state. Massachusetts could secede if Massachusetts wanted. Now, by 1861, 
the, the issue that they all agreed on seceding over was slavery, although that really differed too, state by state. So there were there's seven states that went out before Fort Sumter, but Virginia had not. And Virginia was sort of waiting to see what's going to happen. By the way, Kentucky had not gone out. Missouri had not gone out. Maryland had not gone out. And those three wouldn't go out. But Virginia, when Lincoln called for volunteers, basically to suppress the rebellion in South Carolina, Virginia said, well, the only way he's going to get to South Carolina is by marching through Virginia. And you know, we don't want a, a federal army marching through Virginia. So Virginians went to war to defend their right as states. Now, it's in the quest, in matters relating to history, if somebody says, is it about this or is it about that? The answer is almost always, it's about both. Um, you can, for argument's sake, you say it's one or the other, but in reality, it's about both. And again, I'll just point out that Lincoln went to war to preserve the Union, not to free the slaves. As late as the summer of 1862, Horace Greeley, an abolitionist editor, New York editor, said, so Mr. Lincoln, what is the relationship between slavery and your war? And Lincoln said, my job, my goal is to save the Union. If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do that. If I could save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do that. If I could save the Union by freeing half and leaving the other half in bondage, I would do that. My job is to save the Union. But as I say, um, he eventually concluded that saving the Union required freeing the slaves. It was almost a side effect or it was a war measure. But Lincoln to the very end understood that the Emancipation Proclamation was a temporary thing which is why in the next breath after he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, now we have to amend the Constitution. And if those of the, the viewers tonight who have seen the, the, the Steven Spielberg movie, Lincoln, they'll know that the whole thrust of that is, can he get the 13th Amendment through Congress before the war is over? Because when the war ends, his authority as commander in chief, the authority that he cited to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, it disappears. And you know, it's like Cinderella at midnight. So you gotta, you gotta change the Constitution. And that in the end is, how slavery was ended in the United States. Um, boy, yes. Would you please speak more on why, um, hold on, the chat just took it. Yes, on why Brown's raid and uprising ultimately failed. So this is something that Frederick Douglass understood that John Brown did not, that just because John Brown was willing to risk his life for the freedom of slaves, the slaves were not all willing to risk their lives for their own freedom. Now, John Brown was, what do you mean? If, if I'm going to risk my life for this, wouldn't you? Except that, well, in the first place, if you were a slave and 60 years old, you know, you're not going to go out and start fighting for your liberty. I mean, most of them not. And if you're 10, you're not going to be either. If you're a mother of young children, you know, they're the thing, and this is really hard to get people to acknowledge today, but there were worse things than being a slave. And one of them was being dead. And most of the people who John Brown appealed to, they took a look at John Brown and they said, this guy's gonna get us all killed. And this is what Frederick Douglass knew. Frederick Douglass had been a slave. He had weighed his own chances of freedom. He had, he had thought about trying to flee for freedom before he actually did, but he waited until he had a good chance of success. And so even sort of people who were in prime military age, a 25, 25 year old black slave living in Virginia at the time, they were in a way very carefully, do I wanna get involved with this John Brown or not? They're gonna wait and see whether this has a chance of success. They knew perfectly well that merely having a weapon, if you were a slave in Virginia at the time, that was a capital offense. If you were caught with a weapon in your hand, you could be killed immediately by anybody. And that would be perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal. So they're gonna wait and see if this John Brown thing actually has legs. And when it didn't, John Brown was brave, but he had no military tactical sense. He, he discovered you could get into Harper's Ferry really easily, getting out of Harper's Ferries not easy at all. And so very quickly, the, the raid fell into a fiasco and they were all killed or arrested. And, and this is why nobody wanted to rush to the, the ranks of John Brown because they all would have been killed too. It, it, I, we need to end this because it is seven o'clock, but it does sound to me, if I'm interpreting you correctly, that John Brown was a zealot 
but a zealot without any practical sense. I think that's a fair characterization. John Brown believed that being right was more important than being effective. Yeah. On that note, Dr. Brands, thank you so much. This was, you know, like your last one uh, on Henry Clay and Webster and Calhoun, this was a tour de force. Thank you. My pleasure. Delighted. Come back. I hope I, I hope to. It means probably me. at the rate you go with your scholarship and your publishing, it could be next year. Maybe so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.